Today's video is proudly sponsored by TuxCare, the makers of QEMU Care. If you manage virtual machines, then you're no doubt aware of how tedious it could be to upgrade QEMU. Typically, the process involves restarting each VM that is currently running, and with clusters, you sometimes have to play musical chairs with your virtual machines and shuffle them from server to server as you upgrade the hosts. QEMU Care by TuxCare can help you avoid the tedious aspects of patch day by allowing you to live patch QEMU. With QEMU Care, you can avoid unnecessary downtime with your virtual machines and hosts and still keep them patched and secure. QEMU Care works by live patching the QEMU process itself, which helps immediately protect your systems from malicious actors. And that means you could keep QEMU updated and secure without disruption to the running virtual machines. TuxCare QEMU live patching improves the maintenance and operations for systems that rely on QEMU KVM virtualization for the virtual IT infrastructure. Now you no longer need to orchestrate complex virtual machine migrations to perform the maintenance in situations where QEMU itself needs to be patched. And as most administrators will tell you, getting maintenance windows approved is often the hardest part of the process. With QEMU care, such a window is no longer necessary. It's time to stop restarting processes and entire systems just to keep them patched. Live patching is the future and TuxCare makes it easy. Definitely check out the video on the QEMU Care page that I'll have linked down below and also subscribe for a free trial so you can check it out for yourself. Thank you so much to TuxCare for sponsoring today's video. I really appreciate it. Now, let's get started. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to my Proxmox course. In today's class, what we're going to be doing is launching our very first container. I'm going to show you the entire process. Now, before we get into that, there's a few things that you might be wondering. For example, what kinds of containers does Proxmox allow you to create? And the answer to that is that Proxmox uses Linux containers, or LXC for short. LXC containers are actually pronounced LXC in the industry, and I know that's weird. Don't hate me for that. I'm just the messenger here. Lexi is just how it's pronounced. We have all kinds of strange things in the industry, so it is what it is. Now, Lexi containers are awesome because they're more VM-like than other container types. Now, with other containers, when you actually stop a container, it's deleted and a state is gone, which means if you have a file saved within that container, that file is wiped out. Everything is wiped out. Now, the reason why that's okay is because people generally just create a container image and that'll create the container for them and they'll map some kind of a network share or something like that to the container. So it's still able to, you know, save its state. But Lexi containers are more VM-like. You don't even have to do anything. It automatically saves its state. When you think of a virtual machine, when you shut it down and then you start it up again, assuming your disk didn't fail or something like that, your data is still going to be there and anything you had saved on the virtual hard drive will still be present. With Linux containers, it's kind of like that. The state is preserved. So that's why I say that they're more VM-like than other container types. Now, another thing is that Linux containers are actually not specific to Proxmox at all. I mean, that probably goes without saying the name is Linux containers, not Proxmox containers. Although I do often refer to them as Proxmox containers, I really shouldn't do that. They're Linux containers or Lexi containers. You can launch these containers on any other type of Linux distribution you might be running. So I don't care if you're running Debian, Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, you can run Lexi containers. But again, what's really cool about Proxmox is that they're fully integrated into the web console and we're going to explore that right now. All right, so in this particular class, we'll be walking through the process of creating our very own container within Proxmox. But before we can do that, we actually need to download a template. Otherwise, we won't really have anything to base our container on. So if I click right here where it shows local, it's going to give me several options as far as the different types of things that this particular storage volume is able to accept. And right here, it's already selected on container templates. You can also click right here to see how much storage you actually have remaining on that volume. So as you can see here, I have more than enough space available, so I should have no problem downloading a template. So back here on container templates, 
what I'm going to do is click on templates. And as you can see, we have quite a few different options here. And what I want to do is narrow the list down to Ubuntu. And as you can see, we have more than a few available. I'm going to choose the Ubuntu 2004 template right here. And this particular release is an LTS release, which is why I choose that one instead of the latest and greatest. So I'm going to click download. And right now it's actually downloading that template to my storage. It's already done in my case. And now you'll notice that I have the template right here, so it's ready for use. Now let's walk through the process of creating an actual container. So I'll click this button right here, create CT. CT obviously is short for a container. You probably already figured that out. I'll click on it. And we have some configuration items right here that we will use to customize the container that we're about to create. Now, first of all, it's asking us which host we want this container to run on. In my case, I only have this one, PVE1, as you see here. We haven't actually gotten to the episode yet where we set up our own cluster, so unless you're working ahead, you probably only have one server on your end as well. And not only that, depending on how much hardware you have available, you might not actually go beyond one server. But anyway, I have this server, PVE1, and I want to run a container on this server. Easy enough. Now here we have the container ID. And even though it says container ID, it's not actually different than VM ID. In fact, Proxmox has only one set of ID numbers. There's no separate set of IDs for containers and virtual machines, even though the verbiage here might imply that container IDs are separate, they're not really separate. And here it's automatically selected container ID 103. So just like with virtual machines, it selected the next available container ID because 102 is taken. So it just chose the next available number, which just happens to be 103. Now, for the host name, we need to give this container an actual name. What I'm going to do is call it web server hyphen CT. It's actually pretty easy to tell the difference between virtual machines and containers, but I just went ahead and put CT in the name to make it even easier. So next, what we're going to do is create a password for this particular instance. So I typed it in, and I typed it in again. If you do have an SSH public key, feel free to load it right here. I'll leave that up to you if that's something that you want to use. I'm going to go ahead and skip that for now. I'll click Next. And here we choose the template that we want to use as the basis for creating the container. In my case, I only have one, the one that we just downloaded, so I'll select that right here. Easy enough. For the root disk for this particular container, it's defaulted to 8 GB, I'll just set it to 16. I think that's a little bit more reasonable. And I'll click Next. Just like with virtual machines, we could choose how many CPU cores we want to allocate for this particular container. I'll leave it at one in my case, but if you are running an application that's a little bit more intensive, you might want to consider increasing that. Now for memory, it's defaulting to 512. I'm going to increase that. I'll just set it to 1024 out of habit. That's probably good enough. Now, of course, you could choose to have more RAM allocated for your container if you see fit but I think in my case, that's more than enough. Now we're going to go over networking later, but what I wanna do is actually choose DHCP right here for the IP address. I'll choose that for IPv6 as well, even though I'm not actually using IPv6 on my local network. If you do have VLAN set up, you could add your VLAN tag here if you have one. I'm not going to actually fill that in because, well, I'm not using that. The MAC address, will leave that at auto, we can add some rate limiting here if we'd like, but I'm going to leave that alone. Anyway, I'll click Next. For DNS, I'm going to use the host information here. I don't really see any reason to configure that, at least not yet. And I'll click Finish. And as you can see, that was pretty quick. So I'll close this. And we have our container right here. Now it's really hard to see. You'll be able to see it better in a moment when I turn this on, but there's a different icon here for a container versus a virtual machine. And even though I added CT, short for container here in the name, I didn't actually have to do that. I mean, considering that virtual machines and containers both get different icons, it should be pretty much apparent which is which. Now before I actually start the container though, let's take a quick look at the options. 
Just like with virtual machines, I could choose right here whether or not I want this particular container to start automatically when the host itself starts up. Most of the time, that's something that you'll definitely want, so I'll enable that. We also have the start and shutdown order, just like we did with the virtual machines. That option is here as well. Now I'm going to leave the rest of the options here alone. But one thing I do want to mention is this option right here, unprivileged container. That was actually a checkbox on the very first screen when I went to set up this container. And unprivileged containers are generally safer than privileged containers. An unprivileged container actually has a user mapping when it comes to the root account inside the container, such that it doesn't map to the actual root account on the host system. And for security, that's a lot better. Now, without going too much into detail about containers at this point, if you have an unprivileged container, there might be some applications that'll have an issue running. So if you find that the application that you're running inside your container doesn't actually work as intended, sometimes this is the culprit. When in doubt, just leave this set to unprivileged container. That should be fine. So what I'll do is right click right here and start the container. And then I'll click on the host and let's watch it boot up. And it's already started. I didn't edit that out. There wasn't a bunch of scrolling text or anything like that. It just started. And it's not abnormal that containers are faster than virtual machines. They often are. But anyway, our container is up and running. Now, you may or may not have noticed, but the process of setting up the container, it didn't actually ask me what I wanted the username to be. Actually, the default username is going to be root. And it did ask us for a password, so that I do know. I'll type that in right now. It asked us for that during the setup process for this particular container. And now we're in. So what I'm going to do is run apt install Apache 2. I don't need to use sudo because I'm logged in as root. I'll press enter. Enter again. And there we go. That should be all there is to it. Now, just like virtual machines, containers also receive IP addresses via DHCP. During the setup process for this container, you actually saw me choose the option for DHCP. So if I run IP space A, it gives me the actual IP address, and the last octet there is 253. So down here in my terminal, what I'm going to do is SSH, username root, at 172.16, dot two four nine dot two five three in my case I'll say yes to this message that's weird let me try this again actually I already know what's going on so let me go ahead and go back to Proxmox and let's fix it so what I'm going to do is add a new user and to do that I'll run add user and then I'll add a user by the name of J. Easy enough. Add user and then J. I'll type the password for the new user. Password that I want it to be. And again. And I'm going to skip all of these prompts. They're not required. And there we go. Now, in order to execute commands with root privileges, I'm going to need to add that user to the sudo group. And to do that, I will run user mod dash lowercase a, uppercase g. The group I want to add a user to is the sudo group, and the user that I want to add to that group is mine. So I'll type j right here, I'll press enter. That should be good enough. Now, let's try this again. And there you go, I'm logged into the container. The reason why that didn't work is because by default, SSH access for root is disabled. But if you create a user for yourself, that's not a problem. So I created that user, and then I was able to log in as that user, as you see here. Now, I did install Apache, so let's check that out. In a new tab, what I'm going to do is type the IP address for the container right here. So right here, I have the default web page, as you can see. So that means that the process is a complete success. So we were able to create a container, and inside that container, we installed Apache. Now, Apache is just an example. You can run whatever app you want. But you know, it just shows that the process is fairly straightforward. So there you go. Now you know how to create containers within Proxmox. That's pretty cool.
As you can see, it's easy to use and containers are awesome. At this point, I challenge you guys to create additional containers for whatever you want. I mean, that's actually part of learning, right? Just creating things, deleting things, and just going through the process. That's how you learn. At least that's how I learn. And I challenge you guys to create some extra resources on your Proxmox server. Now, if you'd like to help me out, if you like this series so far, please click that like button. That lets YouTube know that you want to see more tutorials just like this. In addition, if you are enjoying this series so far, please spread the learning. Just share it with your friends, your coworkers, maybe post some links on some social network sites, things like that. I would really appreciate that. Regardless, I'll have the next episode uploaded very soon. So definitely subscribe if you haven't already done so. And thanks for watching.